I know Zolt from my previous life, and um, so it's really great to see you this morning to talk about something that is so controversial um, and at the same time receives attention only once every five years, which is the budget. Um, how we get to fund all these things, and is it too big, is it too small, is it spent correctly, and I think there's some fairly, uh, you know, maybe to, to people who are fresh to EU affairs, pretty obvious suggestions in the memos, but actually for EU veterans, actually very controversial. Um, but let me just start off by asking you, is the MFF big enough? Should the budget be bigger? Should it be smaller? Um, and before we get into how efficiently it's spent and what it's spent on, which obviously is really controversial and up for debate, it's just a, straight off the bat. Do we need to be putting more money into, into the European Union budget? First, there would be a number of pan-European spending areas which would deserve more spending. I mean, we can list many of them. I mean, perhaps the most important one is environment. I mean, Simone in front of me just mentioned a number of ideas on how we could spend more in a useful way on the environment. I mean, research is also uh, a pan-European uh, I mean, uh, aspect. I mean, research is not national. Many research institutes, researchers contribute. Knowledge will become common knowledge and will benefit many, many EU countries. And there could be a number of other areas, like, for example, youth mobility or border protection, migration management, and so on which would deserve more spending. But coming back to your question, um, whether we should spend more, I think we should keep in mind the very special nature of the European Union budget, because European Union budget amounts to only about 1% of European Union GDP, while member states spend an additional 50% of their GDP on various kind of public services. So it means that what the EU spends is just the one-fiftieth of the total public spending in the European Union. So we spend currently a very little amount, but this little amount should be chosen very, very carefully, focusing clearly on spending areas which have pan-European implications. And the big problem at the moment is that some of the large spending items do not belong to that category, and in a number of member states, they are very much concerned that the current, some of the current spending priorities do not constitute a so-called true European public good. Those spending could be done nationally equally well, or even some of them might be even reduced or eliminated. And I think until we get confidence that all EU spending is truly pan-European, supporting pan-European public goods, I think up to that point, it's no reason to, or, uh, to discuss whether the budget should be larger or smaller, because first we should put the current budget or the current spending priorities on a sound footing, and once we can prove that indeed it's based on sound footing, then we can discuss whether we want to spend more on certain issues or not. I think that's a really fair point, and, and, and let's, tackle, let's tackle that issue head on. Uh, the promotion of spending on, on as pan-European as possible, public goods, sounds a really fine, fine goal and, 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 and truly virtuous. But the reality is that, you know, this union and its members operate and make these decisions in groups of alliances dominated by member states. Let's not name names. We all know who they are. And um, one of the top uh, messages in the memos that you've worked on is to um, divest spending from the budget on the common agriculture policy. How is that going to happen realistically? I think every commission for the past 10, 15 years has talked about that. And, and now what's fascinating is that you have such specific uh, areas of policy that genuinely demand desperately more investment. Um, but how do you convince politicians and their constituencies to, to look away from agriculture? And at a time of trade wars where farmers in Europe could end up losing out, um, and at a time when a lot of heads of government 
are facing really tough elections and farmers continue to be an important constituent. Um, how do you do that practically? I, I think you would be hard pressed in Brussels unless any of you are, are sort of have shares in, in some agriculture concern in your country to disagree with you on that, but how to do it? Well, in the previous discussions, the use of a metaphor of a ship has been used, which is going slowly in one direction, and it's very difficult to, to move it or, or, or any other way. And I'm afraid this metaphor also describes how we deal with agriculture policy. In fact, if you look at the past 20 or 30 years, what we do see some gradual reduction in agricultural spending uh, as a share of, of total EU spending or as a share of, share of GNI. So some, some slow process is indeed ongoing. And even the, the previous commission in their proposal, which is currently under negotiation, suggested some, some, I would say, significant cuts to agriculture policy. Now we see a lot of comments from both sides. I mean, especially the major beneficiaries of this policy don't want to see such a huge decline. I mean, others who, who are more skeptical, they, they, they welcome that. I think the key point is to, is to focus on, on what are the real goals of agricultural policy and how do we achieve them. For example, one of the goals is, again, coming back to the environment, is promoting uh, uh, I mean, <clears throat> the environment, fighting climate change, promoting biodiversity, and so on and so on. But you can look at a nice report from the European Court of Auditors, uh, which report concluded that, that the EU's agriculture policy hardly achieves those goals, for example, in, in, terms, of, in terms of agri uh, uh, climate change and, and, and biodiversity. So there are major question marks whether the current policy is able to achieve its goals. And in fact, if you look at the composition of agricultural spending, still the most of it, three quarters of it, uh, includes income support to farmers, uh, which again, in my view, is very questionable whether this is, this is a pan-European uh, rational. I mean, income support is more a social policy, in my view. So if you regard that important, then, then we should call it a, a social policy and not agricultural policy. And what the Commission can do is to write honest reports about the achievements of, of CAP, engage in more and more discussion, involve also more outside researchers into the debate, and again, in a slow-moving way, try to convince member states that reduction in this policy, especially on the income support part, would be justified and we can use the money which we can save for many much more beneficial goals. Um, I'm just going to take a question from someone who used their name. Thank you, Florian Schildhoyer. I hope I didn't butcher your name there. Um, and, and I think he asks a question that's sort of about f funding of, of EU activities, but it's a bit of a sort of side, side branch, perhaps, and maybe you have some thoughts, and I don't mean to ambush you. Um, do you believe that the Commission would need to further mobilize monetary resources to support non-governmental organizations and direct youth toward a more sustainable future? So is, um, which is very political, is this potentially a good use of, of the budget um, apart from big block of policies like what we're talking about, like the agriculture or digital or indeed um, the environment? Um, directing part of the funding specifically to actors who are not within the states or more NGO directed and with a special interest in, in youth? Well, even already several EU programs finance projects for which various kinds of actors, including non-governmental organizations, can apply, and they do apply, and quite significant am amount of money is going to that sector. I think the, the more important question is, what's the purpose of the spending? And then once we identify the purpose, then certainly who should be able to claim or, or apply for such funding comes into question. And, and certainly I, I very much welcome that non-governmental actors, including NGOs, 
also apply and receive funding from the EU budget.